how do you win and how do you serve as a lifelong conservative? That's a big question, and you've heard some people talk about what conservatism is this morning and what it isn't, and you'll be continuing to hear that and shaping it throughout the day in terms of how you see things. But we have a panel coming up next led by Justin Grice, who is a Pennsylvania native and uh, actually lives down in Texas now, Texas-based political operative, he told me, not a strategist, but a political operative. He also said, are you going to read the whole thing here? I said, no, these people are Republicans. They can read this themselves. So I'm going to introduce Justin Grice, who is our next moderator with a panel on how to win and serve as a liberty conservative. Let's welcome Justin Grice. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bright and early here. Scott always gets me pumped up. Absolute champion. Uh, we're going to bring these folks up to the stage quick. I'm not really going to introduce them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I think it's much more interesting to hear from them. So our first panelist here is Jarrett Coleman, state senator in District 16, representing Lehigh and Upper Bucks. And our second freshman legislator, State Representative Wendy Fink, representing District 94, Southern York County. And lastly, Joe Diorsi, State Representative from District 47 in Eastern York County. So I'm going to let these folks tell their story, but the first thing they all have in common is they are newly elected freshman legislators, as you all know probably from being at the event here. They haven't been doing that much, and that's not a slight at them. That's a slight at uh, what's been going on in the Capitol, but we're hoping there's some fun fights coming up. So I want to talk about their election stories, how they all took out rhinos. Is that a safe word to say in here? They took out rhino legislators, big time, very bigly elections. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's hear from them. <clears throat> So, Jarrett, why don't you start us off, tell us a little bit about kind of who you are, how you got here, and the, uh, the election story. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Justin. Um, as everyone, uh, as, I was, as it was said, my name is Jared Coleman, uh, State Senator from the 16th District. Uh, born and raised in the uh, Le Lehigh Valley, uh, was sick and tired of watching Pennsylvanians be oppressed specifically by their government. And uh, whether it was th through COVID uh, and afterwards, I decided to get involved locally on the school board level. And then I decided to uh, take the fight to Harrisburg and uh, run for the state Senate. And it's just been a thrilling experience uh, running against a former uh, state senator, now acting secretary of revenue, Pat Brown. Uh, quite the career uh, establishment incumbent was such a thrilling an invigorating race, and uh, just honored to be in the position I'm in now and to uh, serve the residents of the 16th Senate District. Great. Thanks, Jared. It says something when the, uh, the guy you bust up in a primary gets appointed by the Democrat governor so quickly. That's right. Uh, Representative Fink? My name is Wendy Fink, and I'm recently elected to the District 94, um, which is Southern New York County. Um, I was politically blinded until 2020, woke up in 2020, got involved. Um, started getting involved in my school board, realized that my state representative is not showing up. Um, so I decided to run and took out a, an incumbent of 30 years, almost 30 years, um, chair of the Appropriations Committee. So um, that's one less rhino we have in the House. Great. And Representative Diorsi? Yeah, so my name is Joe Diorsi. I represent the 47th Legislative District, which is Eastern York County. Like Wendy, I have no political experience, I, uh, other than being involved in my school board uh, in the last couple of years. Um, there were a lot of natural reasons for me not to run. I have a young family, and again, I had no political experience, but I was called. And um, I, I just love the system of the Constitutional Republic, and especially during the, the pandemic, I, I saw our rights being stripped away and uh, our constitutional rights, and it wasn't okay with me, so I put my hat in the ring. Surreal experience to knock off a 20-year incumbent, um, but as I always say, I'm only as good as, as my team, and, and I had a great team around me. Great, well let's talk. <laughs> let's start with the election, and then we'll go into legislative. So we'll go with Joe, and then work our way down. So Joe, how, when you realize you're sitting in the seat with a 20-year incumbent, how in the world do you go from you know, sitting there and being moderately politically active or politically aware or just mad about COVID and the issues to taking that step to 
run for office, and then being crazy enough to think you'll win and defy the odds and then doing it and executing on it. Yeah, so, so I'll say again, the, the people around me, uh, the people who are giving me wise counsel, who, who've, who've been in this seat before, who I, who I know and trust, and then just a sea of volunteers who believed in my message. I mean, it, it all came together. Um, and it, it was the joy of my lifetime. And, and I, you know, I wasn't overly optimistic about beating a 20-year income, and I heard all of the statistics. I, I know it happens maybe 4 or 3% of the time. Uh, but I, I was called, I, I went after it, I, I didn't have all the answers, and I, I was honest about that, but the joy of the lifetime was, was knocking thousands of doors, uh, talking with people, there's no substitute. You can call, you can text, you can do social media posts, there's no substitute with talking someone at their, do at their door. And, and at the polls, um, Wendy, you'll probably echo this, Jarrett, I heard about it. Hey, you're the guy that stopped at my door. I actually wasn't there, but you put something on my door. Hey, remember we talked for 30 minutes? And like people remember that, and, and it, was, it was fun on my end as well. Great. And then, Wendy, to add to it, you know, Joe mentioned a couple of the numbers. Incumbents get reelected at over 90%. When the incumbents raise more money and hold the incumbency, it's 96%. And I don't even know if we have a number on it, but to beat an incumbent in leadership and in a very high role is a greater than 96% chance they're going to get reelected. But here she is. You've done it. So kind of the same question to you. How in the world did you kind of build the confidence in the team to get elected and take out an incumbent? Yeah, well, the, the team kind of came out of nowhere. We started to go into the grassroots um, meetings, and people were just tired of of their elected officials not showing up or saying one thing to their face and doing another thing um, in office, and people were just ready for change. Um, like Joe, knocking doors is, is where it's at. I love door knocking, um, thousands and thousands of doors and having those conversations. You know, people just, people weren't aware, because your politician will, you'll go to, to a good fundraiser, fun, fun event, and you'll see them, and they'll, they'll smile, and they'll say one thing to you. But when they get back and went to the floor, their, their votes say something else, or the, the backdoor deals um, that really do happen. Um, you know, they're, they're two different people, and people just want transparency. They want to know that what you see is what you get, and, and that's what you get with, with all of us. Um, we're just an open book, so we ask us whatever you want. Um, when it comes to running against the incumbent, it, it was really tough because we were up against you know, a, a bank, really. He, you know, our, our house race was $1.2 million, um, which is the most expensive house race in Pennsylvania in history. Um, so coming from the background that, that, I'm, that I come from, I don't have $1.2 million to fight back. Um, so we, were, we, we found support in, in CAP. CAP was unbelievable um, in their support for us. And never did I think that we would be doing TV and radio and all the flyers that we have. If you're in District 94, I'm very sorry. Um, some people got up to, to 70 flyers um, for my race, but it was tough. But the people come around and, and, and rally behind you, and that's what keeps you going, is, is the support of the people. And then, Jared, you held a lower office, of course, on school board, maybe a more important office at the time, and were known as kind of the, uh, the voice of sanity and reason. So how did you springboard sort of from the school board to taking on this state senate fight against an incumbent. In yeah, I, I mean, I think for all of you, the important thing out there is that any of the seats in the General Assembly, they don't belong to anyone. In fact, they belong to all of us. And, and the, the current system, the statistics that Justin read off, that is, in a way, to keep you all in line and to not let you challenge this system because it's a lot easier for the incumbents to not have primary challenges and to not have a threat, and it keeps them safe and fat and happy. Um, and, but that's all the more motivation for every one of you to support candidates who are on a liberty platform or want to make a change. I think, for me, as a school board director, I just was bringing a fresh perspective. I, I found it so odd as a school board director that nine school board directors would almost unanimously agree on every single thing. Even with my best friends, we don't agree on everything. How is it possible that you can have nine school board directors agree on everything? And when I showed up and started voting no, 
at first I was ostracized. I mean, it was, it was, they were doing everything they could to try to bully me. But see, when they bully me, they're just bullying all of us. And it's what we've seen with everyone else because they don't want there to be any dissension. They want to show a cohesive group. But when it was voting about wasteful spending with uh, huge general fund balances, as we all just saw something related to this by Auditor DeFore's recent uh, audit on public school fund balances, um, speaking up, being a dissenting opinion is good because if we can't show children and we can't show youth that there is a good way to dissent and there is a proper way to dissent, what are we losing uh, by, by not showing that there is a good cordial way to have proper dissent? Um, I knew right away there was a problem in, my, in the state senate race when I started knocking on doors and no one knew who the state senator was. Um, that, was a, that was alarming to me. Um, I knew that was a problem, and so I continued and, and pushed on. And, and at the end of the day, I, was, I made my, a very good team, uh, joined forces with Citizens Alliance of Pennsylvania, and ran a successful campaign, and now have been uh, you know, honored to be elected as the state senator for the 16th Senate District. But I can't stress enough, none of these seats belong to anyone, and the voters are the ones that decide when it's time to hire and time to fire. Thanks, Jared. Well, uh, Representative Fink, so Jared just you know, said twice now about seats belonging uh, to the people. So how do you know if a rhino is holding this seat and not doing the will of the people? I mean, what are the signs that these folks should look for? I think you really need to follow their, their voting record. Um, like I said before, our, our, your politicians will, will look you in the face and say one thing, and they'll promise lots and lots of things to you. But the, the reality comes, how are you voting? And wh how are you standing up against and pushing back against those things that are not good for us? Um, so keep track of their voting record. It takes a little effort on you. Um, you can't just listen to what somebody else says, what's being done. Um, you need to take responsibility for it and, and get involved and be aware. You need to educate yourself. Gentlemen, anything to add? Sure. I, I think. Generally speaking, it, it's, it's a nominal Republican who compromises on their principles for personal gain. So that's like my canned definition. But I'll, I'll go further. I, I, I believe that, so my authority is God, and my boss is the 65,000 people in the 47th. I think a, a rhino uh, typically views the leadership team as their boss, and that's not how I view it. The 47th my district, the 65,000 people, they're my boss. Senator Coleman, anything to add? Close that yeah, out? I, I agree well, uh, with both of you as well. Um, Pennsylvanians are smart, and if it oinks like a pig and smells like a pig, it's a pig. <laughs> and you can put as much lipstick on, you can throw as much money at these folks as you want. But all of us have good, uh, good ways of finding out who, who these rhinos are. Voting record's a great thing. Also, look at their donors. Look at, look at the lobbyists that are funding their elections. Look at the special interests. Find out, find out the groups they're aligned with. Find out what are their principles. Do you share the same values and principles that these groups that are pouring money into their races? Um, I think when everyone gets elected, they have, uh, you, they, they have a really good Maybe they have a good purpose, they have good intentions, but then they go and they just want to get along and they want to be part of the group and be accepted. Um, but that, when they do that, sometimes it doesn't work out good for all of you. Also, I think a really good way is to see how they sign the cap pledge. So, Well, appreciate the plug, Jared. That is out in the hallway here, right outside the door. You can see every elected official in the legislature who has signed on to cap statement of principles and uh, what we believe rooted in the, both the U.S. and Pennsylvania Constitution. So it's, uh, it's going to be disappointing when you look through those names. I uh, almost assure you about 85% of your representatives are on the bad list, the red list. So take a look. All right, let's transition off campaign and, and into actually governing uh, as, as freshmen. So for our two House members, um, you guys tell me who wants to take it. Give us, like, set the stage of what the hell happened during that leadership fight and what, were the, what do these folks need to know about kind of the wheeling and dealing that occurred there? Okay, so, <laughs> so we don't, oftentimes people ask Wendy and I um, questions about uh, what happened. Um, 
you know, and, and we, we don't, our, our position is unique. We don't know any different. Um, we don't have a frame of reference of when we were in the majority. So all of the chaos is just, we're taking it in. It's, it's normal to us. Um, but I can tell you this, it, the, the scenario that played out with, how, with the Speaker of the House and House leadership is just about as bad as it possibly could have gone. Uh, Wendy, myself, a vast majority of the Republicans in the House knew it would play out that way, uh, but leadership had a different opinion. And uh, we, we had Rozzi for a term, and you would think, how could it possibly get worse? And now we have jo Joanna McClinton, and it has indeed gotten worse. Um, so it, 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 was a, it was a dose of, of um, poor leadership right off the bat. And, uh, you know, I often think, like, we, we have a shortage in government of people with business experience, uh, people with leadership experience. It, it's just stark, and I'm, I'm being frank with you, to, to, walk, to walk into the house and see such a, a shortage of leadership experience, it's, it's shocking. Well, Wendy, maybe if you want to expand on that, um, dur during that fight, of course, we saw a sizable handful of Republicans join Democrats in the vote. Did they try to, uh, to bring any of the freshmen over? Were you approached to join that cabal? Whether you're a freshman or not, um, I think it's pretty obvious. Your first vote, you're not going to want to vote for a Democrat. So no matter what leadership is telling you, um, I think you need to use some common sense. Like, I do agree that we have a lack of um, people with experience and leadership. Uh, we also have a lack of people with morals. Um, and they just can't decide for themselves what is right and wrong. They depend on leadership to tell you this is the way you're voting. And, and there's, there's no reason why. It's just, it's no, this is what you're voting for and why. It's this is what you're voting for because they said so. Um, and we need to really build that that group of liberty-loving patriots in there, um, the Freedom Caucus, it has a good solid 22 um, of us that are really pushing back against um, just being told what to do um, and really thinking this is what's good for the people, right? We, we're not just there to do what we're told to do by leadership, we're there to do what's, what's good for our constituents and having that Freedom Caucus behind us, our liberty-loving patriot um, friends to really depend on um, it's, it's priceless, but yeah, so that day we, were, we sat in caucus for an hour and a half and got lectured um, by leadership. This is our guy. We took a vote. We agreed. This is our guy. We stick together. That's our only chance. An hour and a half lecture on unity and sticking together. We get out on the floor and there's our 16 that, that just pulled the rug out from under us. Um, the the rep that I sit next to, um, Joe Hamm, um, he, he's, he's on Twitter finding out what is happening because our leadership isn't communicating with us. So we are finding out literally what is happening on the floor while it's happening through Twitter because they know before we do. So we need to be careful about who we're putting in, in those leadership positions. <clears throat> So, Senator, I imagine a pretty different experience in the Senate, who are acting as the adults in the room and in government uh, right now, with a functioning, somewhat at least, chamber. Uh, can you just kind of add to that? What's your experience been like being in the majority in the Senate versus, versus the House experience? Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's actually, oh, it's very shocking. Um, the support from leadership has been exceedingly positive in the Senate. Under the leadership of Senator Ward and Senator Pittman, they have supported me and embraced me uh, and, and our, the principles that I bring and the morals that we're bringing and our ideals uh, with open arms. I mean, so much so that suggestions that I was able to make to the Senate operating rules were included day one on the rules that were approved. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And it kind of, for all of us, it makes us think, you know, that's great because Oftentimes, Democrats want to put us in a room and say, we're all extreme and we're radical. But the truth is that our principles and our ideals are actually not that extreme. I mean, things like not wanting to grow the government or not wanting to raise taxes, or I'm sorry, I declined the pension on day one. Why do you have to pay a retirement plan 
for me till I die when it's not supposed to be a career. I mean, these are all things that are supported uh, by lots of people. And, and the, the leadership in the Senate has been refreshingly accepting to everything that I've brought forward. And I think that speaks volumes to them and should give more um, encouragement to all of you. I mean, just a really great experience for me uh, so far. Thanks, Senator. That could change. That may change. And when it does, I'll come back and tell all of you uh, things have changed. <laughs> but so far, it's really good. Uh, I, I think it will change when we take back the House and we actually have to pass legislation and we get a Republican governor again. But we'll get there. We'll see you next year. <clears throat> all right. So, Representative Diorsi, what would you say is the most pressing legislative fight uh, to you personally and your constituents this year? Maybe it's not realistic, maybe it's not going to pass these chambers, but what do you care most about and what kind of motivates you to get up every day? Well, I'll give you two things. Number one, by far, when I campaigned, the top issue was school taxes. And I, I honestly don't know how realistic it is this, this session to, to reform it, but I'm going to give everything I have. Um, it's... Uh, it's, it's simply unjust to, to buy your property, your personal property, pay a tax in the transaction, and then essentially rent it for the rest of your life. It's, it's just not right. We need to reform it. Are we going to clap for that? I mean, come on, people. <laughs> and the, the other topic, which, which has a little bit more likelihood, is school choice. I, the, the EITC scholarships and OSTC scholarships are the tip of the iceberg. I want uh, state funds to, to follow students to the school of their choice. And that's a popular, that's a popular position. Uh, it should be a bipartisan position. And, and my fear is, is that the teachers union just has enough people in our gen General Assembly bought that we won't get it done. But we're, we're going to fight tooth and nail for school choice. Yeah. Representative Fink, so Joe kind of got the fun one. Now I'm going to have you kind of be the realist. What do you think is most likely to pass that conservatives can get excited about in this room? Like, what can we actually do and bring us a few Democrats over? Is there anything? Well, I hate to be the Debbie Downer. Um, I'm not very optimistic about a good conservative things passing through the House. Um, with, with, the, with the Dems in control, I think we're going to see a lot of nonsense going through, and, and the Senate is, is going to be our saving grace. Um, you know, the conservatives, Freedom Caucus, us conservatives, we're, we're going to push for for those um, conservative values and, and, and bills to be passed through. But when you're on a committee of 13 to 9, it, it's not very likely that those, those good bills are going to be passed through. I think we're going to see maybe some moderate things passed through. But um, those conservatives, I, I don't really see it happen. And so 2024, we've got to get it back because um, it, it's going to be dark. It's going to be a lot of no's the next two years. Um, so, Senate, you got to step up. <laughs> yeah, two, well, two, two things I, I want to mention. Uh, one, what I'm concerned of is the budget. I mean, folks, listen, when you make your budgets at home, do you ever use your savings account to pay your bills? Now, Governor Shapiro uh, is a smart man, but this doesn't seem very smart. Why would you spend more than you make? Also, I find it interesting that in the budget, there there was no, in, in the almost presidential campaign theatrical performance that wasted about $60,000 in salary, your taxpayers, for us to sit in the room and listen to it. As an outsider, I can't believe you're all paying to have us go to this performance as we sit there. And he mentions nothing about Reggie, but it's in the budget. That's concerning. Number two, he campaigned on school choice, on lifeline scholarships. Folks, guess what? There's no school choice. So that's concerning to me. Now, something I think a bill that we couldn't get, can get passed is a bill that we're introducing in the Senate that I'm introducing about uh, the pension plan. It's a prohibition against future lawmakers in the Senate. Freshmen will no longer be able to take the pension. It will no longer be an option. The bill, the, this is why I think it should pass. The bill will move, hopefully, to the House. It doesn't block a current participant in SERS. For example, if a House member wants to move on to the Senate, they can keep their pension, but this is a start for us to do complete pension reform. Why would the House vote no on 
office. And the governor should stay out of it. Anyways, that's, that's where I'm at. Oh, thanks for that. Well, in our last few minutes here, I want to give you all a chance to kind of give your uh, closing statement, if you will. What do you want to leave these folks with? Hopefully, we'll see some of them uh, in the future joining your chambers. This is what we need, conservative activists stepping up, taking on hard elections and fights, maybe open seats, too. Uh, but Joe, we'll start with you. What do you want to leave these folks with? Yeah, well, first off, I, I just want to thank uh, Cap for your work in, in, in my election, instrumental in my victory. I also want to thank the Freedom Caucus, who you'll, you'll hear from here in a second. They do excellent work. You can clap for them. Um, and I just want to encourage you, uh, there, there seems to be a higher concentration of liberty-minded candidates like us uh, in the General Assembly. And, and yes, we, we lost the majority in the House for the first time in 10, 12 years. That's bleak. But we have a higher proportion of actual strong conservatives, and that's, that's encouraging. So we, we could be you know, one cycle away from doubling that number, and then we'd be in an even better spot. So I, I want you to be optimistic. You've heard a little bit of pessimism here today, but uh, there's, there's reason to be encouraged. Great. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Representative Fink. There was a little bit of pessimism. I got to say, I'm, I'm an optimist, so that, that answer, that last answer was really hard for me to, to get out because I'm quite the optimist. And I'd like to um, just echo what Joe said. The, the numbers of conservative people in the House is growing. And we've got to get out there. We've got to be finding good candidates to run. Uh, we've got to be training them up and giving them courage. Um, if you are considering running for any kind of office, um, you need to just step up and do it. Um, my, my philosophy is you can't ask somebody else to do something that you yourself are not willing to do. So we heard a little bit from Kellyanne last night. We need to stop whining. Um, we need to get involved. You need to show up to your school board meetings, your township and borough meetings, and figure out what's going on in your community. And then you need to step up and, and help. Um, because these people who are elected, whether they're good, you show up to support them. If they're not good, you need to show up and hold them accountable. So this, this is given back to the people. The people have the power here. We need to get involved. We need to educate ourselves. And we need to be pushing back against the nonsense that, that's coming out all across our community in, in, every, each, in, in every way. Um, I'd like to echo what, what Joe said. The Freedom Caucus is there. We are growing. Um, so talk to your Freedom Caucus members, figure out who's good, who is squishy. Um, we need to get rid of the squishies, follow CAP. They have a good list of, of who is following, walking the line for the people, and who is not. Um, so there are organizations out there and people out there who are, are trying to get the information out to you. Find them, follow them, and ask questions. Senator, final 30 uh, seconds. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, we police our own, okay? We police our own and we hold ourselves accountable. Governor Shapiro, through his cabinet selections, through uh, using the term of uh, reaching across the aisle or bipartisanship, has selected what I think are the most polarizing individuals in our party. It is a strategy by him to separate us, okay? Don't fall into the trap. Find your candidates, support them because we police ourselves through our primaries. But be aware of what's going on on the larger stage here. Finally, together we are very strong, and we need to always come back to our values because that's what brings us together. We can fight it out in the primary, we can, make, we, we can have that discussion, and then once we move forward, we come together and we do the hard work again. Together we are most strong. That's it. Great. <clears throat> The last plug I'll make, you'll see in your program, Citizens Alliance is holding a training and at the Allenberry Resort in Boiling Springs at the end of April. You can get all the information, uh, but these two on the end here were participants last year, and it sure as heck worked out for them, and members of Jared te Jared's team also joined us at that operation. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, legislature, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>